Hello, it's August 3rd, and you're listening or watching the College Football Daily. I'm Brendan Marcello. The Georgia Bulldogs finally broke through and won a national championship last season, a 40-year drought that everybody wanted to make fun of and ridicule the Georgia Bulldogs for, but you could see that they were making incremental progress in the Kirby Smart era, and they finally broke through. And they did so by beating the very team that had been on top of that hill and had really been the thorn in their side for the last five to ten years, and that being the Alabama Crimson Tide. Georgia comes back with a lot of firepower on offense, but their defense loses quite a bit. In fact, eight players were selected in the NFL draft, including five in the first round, off a defense that one would easily label as generational, even across all of college football. So what's next? Can they compete and win back-to-back national championships? We turn to Jordan Hill with Dogs 24-7 to discuss this and much more about the Georgia Bulldogs. Jordan, thanks for joining us. Um, so I, I'll just straight up ask, can Georgia, with the roster they have and that big target on their back, win a second straight national championship this season? That's kind of the question that has been going around Athens since January 10th when they won that first one. You know, it doesn't take very long, and the, conversa- the conversation immediately shifts to, well, can you do it again? Uh, You know, everything I look at, Brandon, you know, I I think it's possible. And the thing that really makes me say that, one, we've seen how Georgia's recruited year after year uh, uh, under Kirby Smart, you know, either the best recruiting class, second, the third, it has continued to be uh, one of the top classes ever since Kirby got to Athens. Uh, But the big thing for me is just the way their schedule sets up. I mean, their their hardest non-conference game is going to be Oregon, which that will be Dan Lanning's very first game. So obviously that's going to make things difficult for Oregon. Uh, You know, the fact that, you know, they've got uh, there's a few challenges along the way. You know, Tennessee, I think with this offense has a chance to be really dangerous at Kentucky late in the year. I kind of wonder, you know, how healthy Georgia will be at that point. Uh, But, you know, I think this team has the potential uh, to make another national title run uh, to have the, the amount of depth they have at tight end that, you know, uh, Todd Munkin, the offensive coordinator, and Stetson Bennett as well are, are going to make the most of to have some of the playmakers like Adonai Mitchell that I'm sure is going to factor in and is expected to take a big step forward. Um, you have that. And then on defense, you've got a few guys that you know you can count on and defensive tackle Jalen Carter, cornerback Keely Ringo, and then you you kind of work in other guys uh, that have shown promise already, an inside linebacker like Jamon Dumas Johnson. You need guys on defense, to me, uh, that need to step up. And Kirby Smart has talked a good bit about that, saying that, you know, we don't lack talent, we lack experience. If they can get those guys experience, particularly on the defensive side, and they can kind of get through those growing pains early, I think they have the potential uh, to be a team we're talking about once we get into December. I still think, I mean, this will be brought up on every broadcast this season. We'll continue to do so just like last year. But, I mean, the story of quarterback Stetson Bennett is just phenomenal. Former walk-on at Georgia, goes from being a backup to being thrown in the fire, and then people questioning whether he should even be the starter, even as late as late last season, uh, saying, is he the guy? Well, he is the guy. He had, I think, the fifth most explosive passing offense as far as passer rating in the entire country last season. He could do a little bit of it all. And boy, did he show up in the second half of the national championship game against Alabama, especially that fourth quarter. So what are the expectations for Stetson Bennett going into this year? Obviously, they're high, but can he consistently deliver as he did late last season? You know, that's the question to me when it comes to the offense as a whole. And, you know, I think if you're a Georgia fan looking at Stetson and and trying to get a good feel for what to expect from his super senior year, you know, I think you have to be encouraged by the fact that, and this was something Kirby talked a good bit about during spring, Stetson talked about it as well. This was his first spring going through as the starting quarterback. I mean, you think about those first team reps, you think about last fall when he gets thrust into the job when JT Daniels gets hurt. There was a point during fall camp, Brandon, where he was taking third team reps. He goes to Todd Monk and is like, I need work. You know, I need reps. Uh, So the fact that he has had an entire year to this point where he's working with the ones, where he's working with a guy like Adonai Mitchell, figuring out the communication, figuring out, you know, even with like Todd Munkin, figuring out, well, I like this play or I like running this play on this spot on the field. 
I just think that's invaluable with the fact that they're going into this year knowing Stetson Bennett is the quarterback. And in any situation where Stetson is not the quarterback, I mean, at this point, as much as they've really spoken highly of the other quarterbacks on this roster, if another quarterback's playing, it's because Stetson's hurt. I mean, that's just the way it's going to be. Uh, so, I mean, they're building this offense with Stetson in mind as the guy. And I think that should, you know, if you're a Georgia fan listening to this, this should have you excited. They are tailoring this offense, knowing Stetson's going to be the quarterback, and they're going to work uh, to get him and put him in positions to succeed in this offense. Is this the best running back room in the country? You know, it's a tough question because they've got some real holes to fill after you lose a guy like Zamir White, you lose a guy like James Cook. But they've got talent. I mean, Kenny McIntosh is a guy that's shown it. And, you know, as good of a pass catcher as James Cook was, Kenny may be even better. And and that's sort of the expectation, especially uh, with him being seen probably as that top running back. I think the biggest question that will determine if this is, you know, the deepest running back room is if Kendall Milton can stay healthy. That's been a problem the last few years. He's had some knee injuries. Missed, I think, four games down the stretch last season. And he comes back for the national title game. But, I mean, they've got an argument. They've got an argument with the running backs on this roster. Also bringing in uh, Branson Robinson, a guy that, if you remember last year, he, his photo of him just, you know, look, looking hulked out at a rival's camp, I mean, just blew up on the Internet. All of a sudden, Georgia gets him, uh, has Andrew Paul, a three-star from Texas, that I've impressed a lot of people uh, when it came to signing day in February. He kind of came onto the scene. Uh, so they've got an argument. I think the biggest thing is if – Kendall can kind of stay healthy. He's seen as that one-two punch with Kenny McIntosh. Um, but they've got a lot of potential as far as an entire running back room. And you throw in Dejon Edwards, too, with those guys who, you know, oh, by the way, he was a four-star, too. So, I mean, they, they definitely do not lack for talent when it comes to running back. Well, that's the thing. They don't lack for talent really at any spot. I mean, they've been no lower than fourth in the 24-7 sports composite in each of the last six recruiting classes with a couple of number one classes just for good measure in there. Uh, the offensive line stacked as well, right? Yeah, I mean, they're in good position. Really, the only question is that left guard and right guard. And the, and the thing that I think benefits Georgia when it comes to those two positions, they have several options. It's just going to be a matter of figuring out who fits best. Left guard, you know, coming out of spring, it was Xavier Trust, a guy they recruited out of Rhode Island. I believe he was a four-star, really talented guy. They've moved him inside. He performed really well, I thought, at G-Day. I think he's in a good position, uh, but there's going to be competition. Uh, you know, and also the right guard position is definitely the one that there's more questions about. You know, the guy that is the key in my mind with how this offensive line comes together is Tate Ratledge. Uh, this is a guy who is really well thought of as a recruit uh, coming out of Rome, Georgia. And, uh, you know, he was in position last year to start. Clemson game, they may get five plays in and he suffers a Liz Frank injury, yeah. and he's done for the year. And uh, it's a really tough injury to come back from. Kirby's talked several times about that. Um, but it sounds like things are going well in his recovery. Uh, I think, you know, that he's got a chance to be that starter. Um, but it's not going to be easy. Uh, Devin Willick is a guy that played right guard at G-Day. He's a guy that they sound really excited about. And then the other guy that might factor in as well, uh, is uh, Warren Erickson, who wound up starting in Tate Ratledge's place last year after he got hurt. Uh, but other than that, those those positions, they're in good shape with the other three offensive line positions. Cedric Van Pran, the center, he was at uh, SEC Media Days, guy they really trust already, even as a redshirt sophomore. Uh, Broderick Jones at left tackle, yeah. this will be his first year starting. But he played four games down the stretch last year, gets thrust into the national title game, uh, when they moved Jamari Sawyer over when Warren, Warren Erickson got hurt. Uh, and then Warren McClendon at right tackle is a guy that, you know, he, he kind of hadn't been talked about a whole lot. And I see with some of the draft stuff for 2023, doesn't get as much mention as a guy like Broderick Jones, but he's been a wall man. And, and he's been a guy that has consistently held up at right tackle. And uh, I think with those guys, you know, once they figure out the two guard spots, I think they're going to be in really good shape. Okay, so my big, my biggest question, honestly, about this Georgia team is receiver. I mean, you know, listen, you got George Pickens going to the NFL draft, of course, and then Jermaine Burton goes to Alabama, uh, the r main chief rival for Georgia to try and win a national championship now with the rival fans there. So 
What does Georgia look like at receiver this year? Are they going to lean more on those tight ends, as you mentioned, because they are just absolutely stacked there? Or are we missing maybe a couple of big names that are really going to stretch this field this season? I, I really like McConkey, but you tell me. Yeah, I mean, I think this offense is going to revolve around those tight ends, but I think they're going to be in a situation, and I'm really intrigued with these early games, just seeing who kind of comes out of this rotation at receiver. I feel really confident that Adonai Mitchell is that number one guy. I think Lad McConkey is going to be that flanker. I think he's a guy that showed a lot of promise last year, made a lot of plays. And then I think Karis Jackson, a guy that's been there for a minute, he's going to be a senior. I think he's going to be that slot guy. But they've got other guys that through spring you kind of looked at plays and went, hey, this this guy might have something. Dominic Blaylock is a guy that's had two knee injuries to the same knee, uh, and it's really a shame he was coming on in 2020 and got hurt in the SEC title game. Uh, uh, That actually might have been 2019 when they played LSU, got hurt in the first quarter, and has just been trying to work his way back. Uh, You know, they've got some young guys, Chandler Smith, is a freshman that was originally committed to Florida. They fired Dan Mullen, and all of a sudden Georgia, Georgia jumps on board and gets a another track star that's got a whole lot of speed. And speaking of track stars, Arian Smith is a guy that has dealt with injuries, but when he's been healthy, he's made big plays. Had a big fourth quarter, uh, or fourth down touchdown against Missouri last season, uh, but didn't get to play a whole lot. Was dealing with injuries. So they've got options at receiver. Marcus Rosemi, Jack Saint is a guy that two years ago got hurt on a touchdown against Florida. So they've got guys, and I feel like the top three of that pecking order are pretty clear with Mitchell, with Kyrus Jackson, with Lab McConkey. But I want to see how these other guys factor in because I think they're talented, and I think they have the potential uh, to play and, and play a decent bit. Uh, but it's just sort of figuring out what kind of roles they can carve out in, again, an offense where I think we're going to see a whole lot of two tight end sets and, heck, may even see some three tight end sets along the way. All right, so defensively, generational defense, I think a lot of people would argue it's the best defense we've seen over the last 10, 15 years, and that's including those incredible defenses at Alabama, LSU, and even further back a little bit, Miami. So lose eight guys to the NFL draft, but – You got Jalen Carter returning along the defensive line. You got Nolan Smith, who's an incredible outside linebacker. And then Kelly Ringo, as you mentioned, a cornerback who's a tremendous corner and lockdown guy. Where are the areas that they're concerned with and how far of a step back does this defense take? Because you figured it would being a once in a generation type defense that it was last season. Yeah, I think it's only fair to say they're not going to replicate last year. I mean, it's just it's, it's darn near impossible. But I think this defense can be really good. I think this defense has potential to be one of the best in the SEC and pretty much by proxy be one of the best in the nation. To me, the, the questions really are going to be uh, along the defensive line outside of Jalen Carter. I mean, he was a guy that even last year people, you know, they had Jordan Davis and Devontae Wyatt, two guys who wound up being first round picks. And yeah. a lot of people were saying, you guys need to pay attention to 88. You, we got to figure out how to stop 88. So you just think about what that's going to mean. Uh, you know, knowing he's going to be double teamed a whole lot. They need other guys to step up. Uh, Zion Logue is probably going to be the nose tackle. He's a, he's an older player. He's going to be taking on a bigger role. He's talked this spring about the fact that he had to learn, you know, he had to grow up. You know, he didn't take it very seriously when he first got to Georgia. You know, it was kind of lax and and going to class, stuff like that. I think he's a guy that has understood what's expected to play and and to play at a high level at Georgia. He's a guy that uh, they need to do that to let Jalen Carter shine. Uh, And then at defensive end, it's kind of one of the biggest question marks on this whole team uh, at – uh, G Day, they played Tyrion Ingram Dawkins, a guy that's not really a defensive end, but he played really, really well. He's he's kind of more of a defensive tackle. Do they yeah. go with him? Do they go with a five star in Michael Williams? Uh, Tremel Walthor is another guy that's been on this roster and as a senior, how they kind of figure out that position. And, and besides really the defensive line, they can figure out who the other safety is going to be besides Christopher Smith after lo- losing Lewis Seen, who was one of those five first round defensive players you mentioned, I think this defense is going to be okay, but I think we might see some tinkering in these early games, maybe see some guys uh, thrown into different positions, Uh, but they've got to figure out in my mind, the defensive line and that second safety spot um, in order to, you know, again, I don't think they're going to, you know, 
rewrite the record book two years in a row, that's just asking a whole lot. Uh, but I think this defense does not lack for talent when you think about how Kirby Smart and, and really this whole staff have continued to stack talent year after year. Yeah, defensive corner Dan Lanning capitalized on that incredible success last season, landed the head coaching gig at Oregon. Georgia opens the season against Oregon, which is going to be so amazing to watch because of the storylines alone, let alone what it means for the SEC and the Pac-12 early in the season. But what, what is Georgia doing at coordinator on defense? Uh, some familiar names there. Who's calling the plays? And is this really just Kirby Smart's defense still? And it's just a matter of whose voice is on the headset calling the plays on game day? Yeah, you're going to find this hard to believe, Brandon, but a head coach is, is keeping the cards close to his uh, chest. He's not Kirby has not really said who's calling the plays. Uh, there's co-defensive coordinators right now. Glenn Schumann, who has been on the staff, was one of Kirby's first hires when he came over from Alabama. He's a co-defensive coordinator. And then Will Muschamp is also the co-defensive coordinator. He came to Georgia last year, was initially just going to be an analyst, came on board once Scott Cochran took his leave of absence. And uh, then this year he's going to be co-defensive coordinator and safeties coach. So, yeah, Kirby's been asked who's calling the plays, and he's saying that's not really all that important. So who's calling the plays? I'm not sure. I mean, going back to – I was still in school when Kirby uh, came to Georgia in that first season in 2016, and Mel Tucker was the defensive coordinator, but everybody kind of knew who was calling the plays, and it was Kirby. Uh, you know, I think it's kind of a combination, honestly, of the three. I think that uh, when it comes down to it, you know, it's probably Kirby calling the plays. Um, but he's not exactly said who, you know, has the title of defensive play caller between Glenn Schumann and Will Muschamp. Well, hopefully Will Muschamp doesn't get angry if he's not calling plays and ends up punching a couple of uh, whiteboards in the locker room. Uh, so fascinating. What is anything less than an SEC title disappointing for Georgia fans this year? What are what are the expectations Georgia fans should have and do have right now? Do have, I think that people want to see a repeat of at least an SEC title. I think realistically, given what they've lost, getting back to Atlanta, in my opinion, is a fair barometer, not only because of where this program is, but again, I, I just, there's not that team in the East right now that tilt that I just say, well, you got to watch out for them. Now, we could be surprised. And I think there's teams uh, that have taken tremendous steps forward, teams like Tennessee and Kentucky. But I just don't, you know, barring real issues with injury, I feel like getting back to Atlanta is a very fair, uh, you know, goal that, that this team can achieve, especially having lost, heck, 14 starters from last year. Uh, but, you know, after a, t after a fan base gets a national title, especially one that waited as long as this one did, I'm sure people want to aim high. Um, you know, I think even if they wind up winning the SEC or winning the East, and maybe lose to, say, Alabama uh, in the SEC title game, you know, they potentially could still make the playoff. Um, but to me, I think a realistic expectation or a goal for this team uh, is to win the East again and then have another bout with Alabama that we've seen uh, give us some really good games over the last few years. Georgia still in the heavyweight division of college football, still in the top four, thanks to obviously some great coaching and also recruiting. Over these last several years, we'll see if Georgia can do something that's very difficult in college football day, these days, and that's repeat as a national champion. For our producer, Lance Glenn, I'm Brendan Marcello. Thanks for listening to the College Football Daily, and thanks to our guest, Jordan Hill, Dogs 24-7. Make sure to give him a follow on Twitter and check out Georgia Dogs 24-7 on the 24-7 Sports Network. We'll chat again on Friday.